This is Legislature's The Inside Story. Thank you for listening. I'm the host, Tim Story, CEO of the National Conference of State Legislatures, NCSL. My guest is Paul Danchik, Director of Executive Education in Sacramento for the University of Southern California, Saul Price School of Public Policy. I was especially excited to visit with Paul because he's a close partner with NCSL as the co-director of the Legislative Staff Management Institute, LSMI. LSMI is a flagship program of ours that has provided hundreds of legislative staffers with the opportunity to develop and enhance management and leadership skills in a high-level executive education setting. Applications for the next session of LSMI are open through April 14th, and you can find out about that on NCSL's website. Paul designs and presents leadership and management programs. He also serves as an executive coach. Our discussion covered everything from imposter syndrome and decision fatigue to why understanding the patterns of behavior in an institution is critical for leaders. We also discussed our mutual respect for people in public service and the enormous challenges they face today. What a treat it is for me, Paul Danchik, uh, to have you on the podcast uh, today. I truly am grateful. I've really been looking forward to catching up with you and talking about leadership and legislatures and LSMI at some point. So, Paul, thanks for uh, thanks for coming on the podcast. Tim, it's great to be here. I always love being able to connect with you and admire the work that you're doing at NCSL. We will get into it as we move on, but obviously you have a, a history with NCSL that's quite special, and, and I'd love you to spend some time talking about the LSMI, Legislative Staff Management Institute. So we're going to put that, uh, that's, that's maybe chapter two or chapter three in my uh, sketch of things I'd like to talk about, but... I spent some time, you know, figuring out the, the where your focus has been, and and your focus is what we often talk about on this podcast: leadership, excellence, um, change, and transition, transformation. Um, complicated uh, concepts in the legislative world. I really appreciate that you're somebody who understands legislatures, but is also very deep into public administration um, practice and theory and. First, talk a little bit about the Price School and the you know your 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 role there. I'm the director of executive education for the Soul Price School of Public Policy, based in Sacramento. We have two different campuses. Los Angeles, of course, is our main campus, and we're up north to be able to connect with the policymaking community of California. So tied in right at the state capital. Uh, I've been working at USC for just under 20 years, 19 years, and some change right now. Uh, focused on this leadership space, on how do we create great public organizations and recognize that as much as we want to believe that the systems we created are non-human, they're filled with human beings. So therefore, they're human systems uh, that have some human flaws associated with it. And we're there to help support those that are in leadership positions to be able to do great work um, and recognize there's a lot of transformation happening within public service. My specialty is focused on uh, state legislative environments and county governments. So it's where the rubber hits the road from all the policy making that you all create. Well, I know that you do executive coaching has become a big part of your portfolio and time. And, you know, you've developed some systems to think about leadership in, in public administration. And I was thinking about this, this intersection between sort of executive leadership and legislative branch. And I know the word executive means two different things in this context. That there's sort of the executive branch but then we use it to, you know, to mean, you know, top managers, top leaders of organizations writ large. And so that's kind of one, one reason I'm really excited that, that we're having this conversation, because there's, as you know, uh, all too well, there are sort of two groups within legislatures, really three, I guess, if you talk about there's the legislators, there's the legislative staff, and then there's the others, the, you know, the advocates, the lobbyists who come into the equation. And executive leadership could mean very different things for those three different groups. I really am sort of fascinated by your executive coaching. How long have you been, you know, sort of doing the, the whole time? Have you been executive coaching the whole time? In a formal capacity over the last nine years. Uh, when we think about the field of executive coaching, it's similar to other professions where there's professional training involved uh, for those that are certified coaches. So I became certified about, about nine years ago, somewhere around that time frame. I've worked with over 600 executives as I'm framing it, right? So it's those in leadership roles, not the executive branch in this case. Sometimes when you do interviews, you do this kind of work, you start to hear some of the same things, you know, over time. And so I'm curious, like, what, what are the, what are the more, most common themes you hear? Like, wow, it turns out we all have the same problems and issues or, 
maybe not. Maybe there are things that are very unique. Uh, so, so what are the common challenges you've heard when talking to people in those roles? You know, there's a, a lot of similarities, right? And, you know, when you talk about a legislative environment, there's a lot of organizations that are very similar in structure, although how people get into those roles looks different. So universities, for example, are very similar to uh, legislative environments when you're talking about the structure, right? Where you have a certain group of people that are protected and a certain group of people that support those that are protected. So university level, right? You have your tenure professors, and then you have the staff level and you have the dynamics in between. Legislative environments are very similar, right? We have the elected officials coming in and you have the staff to be able to support them to be able to do great work. When you think about organizations like that, while uh, there's some, they're structured that way, uh, most organizations aren't, right? They're more of a hierarchy coming into play where you come in at some point in time along this hierarchy and you work your way up to the to the top if that's your interest and motivation to be able to do it. These types of environments where you have that clear cut of knowing who's faculty and who's not faculty, who's elected, who's not elected, it causes different types of dynamics within the organization because not only are you identifying those challenges that are in a traditional type of organizational structure, so that being I'm in a staff role, I have a certain staff hierarchy that has certain accounting built into it. I also have this small p politics coming in in a different way, right? Where there's this line that's maybe an invisible line that we know is there, and we're also sensitive to uh, knowing what our role is within that type of structure um, and when we can step over it and when we can't. And because of that, when we look at staff, particularly staff level within those types of organizations, the types of accountability measures. Uh, that you would typically have within the structure. So that being uh, thinking about placement or promotion or pay, those things are uh, less important. And what's more important is influence of how do you influence the behaviors of each other to work collectively together towards a common goal. And when we look at this coaching space, what we recognize is that we all get stuck in different ways and it looks different for each one of us, which is one of the reasons why I love the coaching space because it's getting into this professional development realm, right? Recognizing that, look, if we're going to grow as individuals within our professional space, we have to find those opportunities to continue to learn. And when we're in group settings, that has a certain type of outcome focus, but you're collectively learning. The executive coaching space is saying, even in this big umbrella of topics that you know we're co-exploring together, I'm interacting with it maybe in a slightly different way than the person sitting next to me. And how do I get unstuck from where I am? So getting back to your question, Tim, of where people tend to get stuck within this space, there's a lot with team dynamics of how do you interact with your team, right? So those might be more in the organizational space of having a difficult employee and you know, how do you help them where they are? We also see a lot around the imposter syndrome of, you know, how do I get to where I am? And this would be true both in the staff level and on the elected side, right? It's getting into um, an unusual dynamic, right? Because as much as we're forward facing of putting on a certain persona when we're fulfilling our duties and our roles, there can be some self confidence issues that start to arise. Um, and recognizing that that happens to all of us, right? It's part of the human experience. Coaching is a field for a number of different reasons, right? There's all the theoretical backings of uh, why we get into this work, things that we can do. Um, with the client, things that we can work on with the client, the whole confidentiality piece comes into play. What distincts coaching from mentoring, for example, is that we're not with the individual within our organization, right? So we're almost at steam release valve of being able to talk to someone who understands the context, understands the environment, and also has no authority about how you perform within the workplace environment, right? We're not connected to HR in most cases. We're not linked to your supervisor in most cases. It's really all about the individual and because of that, we build up our thoughts, our pressures, our perspectives, and we often don't have a release valve because in the workplace, it might not be a safe environment for us to have some of those conversations. Our loved ones at home might listen to us, but not really get what we do in the first place, let alone how to just hear and help grow from where you are. And the coaching profession helps do that, right? Being able to recognize the work that you're doing, understanding the context and the environment in which you work. And also get what it's like to be a human being. Um, and because of that, we ask tons of questions and help the individual get unstuck from where they are um, without directing them in a certain way, because no one knows their environment better than they do. You raised this question of the imposter syndrome. I kind of latched onto that because I could see this being 
a common theme in legislature world, uh, both on the staff side and on the legislator side. Is that what you find most common when you, you know, your second session of coaching, you know, you've kind of established a, a, a confidential space and some trust. Uh, and then they're like, well, I, I, I sometimes wonder how I, how I belong and how I fit in when I look around at my 99 colleagues on the house floor, or um, I look around at these amazingly smart people in the legislative agencies. Uh, I wouldn't say it's the most common. I would say it's more common than you think it would be. And then what do you tell them? I mean, what's, what's your advice for people who are saying like, I, I don't, I don't belong here. These are the, these are impressive people. That's where the individuality comes into play with coaching, right? Because the way that I think about my role within this space, there's not one single right answer. If there was, Tim, I would not work at USC. I would be a consultant making gazillions of dollars uh, because I had the right answer. And I would go spread the word with everyone and make money on the, on the speaking circuit. Fundamentally, though, it's, a, it's an individual experience, right? So what I think where I'm getting stuck is going to look different than maybe where you're getting stuck. And because of that, being able to work with a coach and exploring what are those foundations, how do I understand the environment, how do I grow and learn from it, um, that's where the steps come into play. What I recognize within this field, though, is you can see transformation happening even in a small amount of sessions. So we do uh, spot coaching, which is two or three sessions um, that's actually tied to the Legislative Staff Management Institute as an experience on what does this coaching space look like? How can I consider using it in a my professional experience as just a development tool. And I have clients that are long-term clients. And what I recognize is that transformation can happen pretty fast within a short time frame. So the conversations that we have within the spot coaching is look different than the longer-term clients uh, because you're, we're working with them in a different way because we're able to see trends that start to emerge, aha moments, and then different types of application for those clients that might be uh, longer in nature you're seeing it put in an application and recognizing that sometimes we're going to fall back to past behaviors. Give us like a, an amalgam of that experience, or I mean, even a specific example, obviously you're not going to tell us who or what you know situation, but like, I kind of want, I want you to tell a story about this so I can understand it. I remember one of my first longer term coaching engagements was from a senior executive in a public office in Florida. So in this case, a public office is not an elected position but one in large organizational structure, she got to the point where she couldn't make decisions. I mean, this is where, as a coach, you have to be able to separate yourself from who the client is and getting caught up in their story and focus on the, the art of coaching. I was struck by this person because they're in such a senior position and they hear them say, I can't make a decision anymore. And for her, it was because she knew that every decision she would make would impact a lot of kids and every decision that she would make would hurt a lot of kids. And she got paralyzed by policy, essentially, right? So you're working when working with that type of client is getting into the foundations of understanding how did you get to this point? And in order to get to that role, she had to be really good at making decisions, right? Her discernment had to be just spot on for the organization to recognize that she's the one to fill X role. And then once there, over a period of time, to become paralyzed in making decisions is a reflection of her environment, right? It's a reflection of how she's showing up within that space and how do I best help her um, from where she is without telling her what to do. When we start getting into the space on when we're looking at working with clients, we're not in the spot to tell them that you have to do X, do X Y, and Z and you'll get out of this situation. That's not our role. Our role is to be able to recognize what's happening within this environment and how do we help the client from where they are of recognizing that they're going to have good days and bad days. And we're not to tell them what to do, but we're to help them explore why is it happening? What trends, what patterns are we watching? I was told this a long time ago, Tim, that consultants always have to have a good iceberg analogy in their back pocket. Let's picture an iceberg right now. And the top of the iceberg, the part that you can see um, is our environment right? And we tend to react in that space, right? We see something happen and we react. And if we look underneath, right, if we see how the iceberg is made, if we put it into three different chunks, you know, we can think about in terms of patterns of behavior. So what are those patterns that create that visibility piece? We can think about in terms of structure, of what structures are in place 
that help facilitate you know a certain type of outcome and then the human experience right the mindset the feelings the emotions how we respond to it our style is all underneath the surface level and what we start to recognize is if we're always operating at the top we're always in a constant reaction mode and if we're in a constant reaction mode it's linked to stress it's linked to burnout it's tied to all these just very human uh, responses and characteristics right of just how we understand the world and if we allow ourselves to understand what's happening in our environment through different lenses right if we're looking at it through patterns of behavior if we're looking at it through structure if we're looking at it through style we're able to step back still be in the same environment but be able to step back and respond and fundamentally what i try to do in my work is get us away from the reaction type of response into a response mode of being able to say i can react and there's times when i have to react but sometimes i'm reacting when i can really respond so am I just looking at the environment at face level or am I pulling in different perspectives into the mix? And that's what we try and help uncover. Of what are those things that we know are happening, but we just don't see it in the moment because we're caught up in the reaction space? I'm thinking about legislatures being in session, which most of them are. Sessions are these unique creatures because they have these you know, really hard time limits for the most part across the country, not all states, but even in the full-time states, you know, they've got their deadline. So there is just this tremendous pressure because of the <clears throat> because of the volume of decisions that come through, whether you're a legislator or a legislative staff person who has to get research into the stream as fast as possible. So you've got tremendous volume, hard time pressures. So of course it's going to be stressful. And and of course my thought is like everything is reaction. Um, and by the way, I'm also fascinated by this notion of decision paralysis, which I think is probably more common than in just your, your example in Florida. But if you're a legislator or a legislative staff person, you're making decisions constantly. Every bill you vote on, you might vote on hundreds of bills, especially toward the end of session. You're making decisions about what information to provide on a particular bill if you're the legislative staff side. It just feels like an environment that's not conducive to respond versus react. So it, parse that out a little bit. Like, what do you mean by react? What do you mean by respond? And how do you find perspective in a world that's moving so fast. So, you know, how do you, how do you balance all that? What you're describing is recognizing that, you know, as human beings, we make decisions all the time. But what you're describing are decisions that have a different risk level associated with them. Me making a decision on what I'm going to have for lunch, low risk. Me making a decision on, you know, a major policy issue, probably high risk, maybe moderate to high, depending on what type of legislation it is, Right. But you're right. You're always in that constant mode. And what happens when we're making decisions within that space, decision fatigue is a real thing, right? It could be that at the end of the day, you know, you're just so wiped out from making high risk decisions all day long that when it comes time to taking care of yourself, like what am I going to have for dinner? Let someone else handle it. Just bring me a sandwich or, you know, whatever it is, because I don't want to make another decision uh, for the day. What I'm talking about, though, is this type of environment of saying, Look, when we're recognizing the patterns of behavior that start to emerge, and the legislative uh, environment is a really good example of being able to, to watch patterns of behavior happen. You know when the filing deadline is. You know when the end of session is, right? You know what these deadlines are. You can recognize what are the patterns of behavior that start to emerge in order for us to meet certain deadlines. Introduction of the bills, drafting of bills, the committee levels, right? You're watching all these pieces interact with each other. And for the ones that we can start to anticipate of saying, look, I know that this piece of legislation is working its way through the system and I can get ahead of it. It's a low risk piece of legislation, maybe that has bipartisan support. It's going to have the governor's signature on it, right? Those types of uh, pieces of legislation, for example, can be started at a different time frame than ones that might have a larger political risk associated with it or a larger policy impact or fiscal impact, you know, whatever that, that pressure point might be. So not everything is coming towards the end to be able to make a lot of high-risk decisions on everything. You're able to say, oh, we can spread this out in a different way, that we can still get the job done, we can still have the public debate for it to happen, and we can do it in an environment that decreases some of the stress of the system. And when I'm talking about stress of the system, we can talk about stress on the system itself, right? If we look at it from just a pure outside perspective of watching these pressure points, we can also talk about stress of the system as me as an individual of when am I just going to purely explode? When we see 
people that interact with the system, you start to recognize that you know pressure hits people in different ways. You know, it can be very, very energizing for a lot of us, but it has to be good stress, right? If it starts having that bad stress, then that's when we start to shut down and start to burn out. And we can recognize that when that happens as well. I think another interesting dynamic is looking at the way that the state legislatures operate of looking at, you know, full-time, part-time, looking at how the electives come into play. You know, is it, are they known candidates coming in? Are they known personalities into the mix? Is it always someone new? Uh, those would add different levels of stress into the environment because the patterns of behavior aren't known yet, right? So if you have an elected official that's been there for 20 years, you have a really good sense that when I go see Tim, I can anticipate this type of response from him. Now, if Tim is new, we don't have a relationship yet, Tim. So I don't know how you're going to respond to this or not. I don't know if you're going to be holding a hard line all the way through. I don't know if you're going to be kind of still thinking about it kind of mode and really thinking about it or just saying I'm thinking about it when you really have your heart set on a certain direction, right? That part of the relationship isn't is informed yet. So when we talk about, you know, that iceberg metaphor, when it's someone that's been there for a long period of time, if I'm not a student enough to be able to recognize patterns of behavior and how the system interacts with that, I'm going to be in reaction mode all the time when I don't have to be. The point is getting ourselves into that space of saying, there's times when I have to react, but there's also times where I can respond in the same environment if I understand patterns of behavior, how the system works, and fundamentally who I am as an individual um, and where I get my energy. Sometimes I marvel that legislatures as institutions perform as well as they do, given the, the limits and the stress factors that come on them, because I don't think they were designed for efficiency. Um, I, I think they were, you know, they've got this maximum transparency element to it. So I, I guess this leads me, you know a lot about the legislative environment. And, you know, if, if you were to redesign, if you could do legislatures 2.0 or 6.0, you know, what would your magic wand power be to change the legislative world, the legislative environment? You know, there's so many great factors about it, which is one of the reasons why I kind of, well, not kind of, why I geek out around public service. There's a reason why our organizations are structured the way they are. And sometimes it is to slow down the process to allow us that space to be able to think, debate, and really figure out what we hold as a collective value, I think that's where part of the challenge comes in, maybe in, in modern um, elected environments. And certainly legislatures would be part of this, but I think we could talk about other types of elected bodies that might face similar types of challenges. And that's looking at who's coming into to public office and why are they coming in, right? That would be one. The influence of social media, I think it's a huge modern factor that we're still figuring out on what that looks like. Right? And that's part of the excitement of the work that we collectively do. Of It's changing all the time. Fundamentally, we recognize that leaders do two things really well. So two different uh, streams of thought. One is that they spend a lot of time reflecting. And when we talk about reflection, it's understanding for myself, how does this, uh, what does this mean for me? How does it tie into my environment? We can think about in terms of internal self-awareness, right? I'm just in my head thinking about, what today was like, and maybe I like to journal, or maybe I like to, you know, capture my thoughts in a very specific way. But it's a very individual type of game. Uh, we can also think about it as external self awareness of Am I getting feedback from you, Tim, on how I showed up today? Right? What does that look like, and how does that influence what I might do tomorrow? Right? So we can think about that self awareness piece. The other thing that we know that great leaders do really well is they place a high value on two things. They place a high value on outcomes and a high value on relationships. And when one of those is off, kind of fun things happen, right? So if a leader is focused too much on the outcomes, it creates a very competitive environment, right? So if we go to a legislative environment, we can see when our environment becomes very competitive. There are certain bills, uh, there are certain uh, initiatives that come through that just become very competitive, usually in a partisan way, not always. But we can see when the outcome is creates that competitive environment. If it's too much on the relationship side of the house, then we focus on accommodation where we just go along to get along, right? And when that happens, the outcome piece starts to suffer, right? Which you don't really get anything done. You're just always appeasing the other person. 
And we can see examples of this happening within elected bodies all the time, right? We can see when there's a high focus on outcomes that they get the job done, but it's really hard on relationships. And we can see times when it's all about the person or the people, usually the person, and you don't get anything done, right? You're just kind of spinning your wheels. You're doing the minimum. Maybe it's the the new minimum Mondays in the legislative context. I don't know, right? But you start seeing these two different dynamics play out. When a leader focuses on both, right, when they're hyper-focused on outcomes and relationships, you see something different happen. And this is generally the way we've been framing collaboration in a contemporary context, right, where people are not only getting along, they're also getting the job done. And this is where you're able to start from a strength and continue that strength. If I would change anything within our uh, political environments right now, it would be understanding that dynamic of how to get the job done and also hold relationships because particularly right now, I see a lot of relationships being strained in ways that just aren't helpful for the human experience. It's not helping us collectively as a society. And you know, I think a lot about the federal side because we're all impacted by the federal side. Um, that's not helpful for how states govern because that type of cultural trickles down into the state governments and then it trickles down into the local governments. It's predictive, right? We can watch it happening. Um, and it's also very concerning of how do you um, how do you manage such paradoxes, right? The paradox of relationships and outcomes to be able to to do just great work for our society of recognizing that we're all in this together, and our values can also shift over time. So how do you make sense of all that? And that's why we need great elected leaders to help us guide the way. I, I'd kind of like to reverse that notion that oh, what happens at the federal level trickles down to the states and trickles down to the locals, because I, I think frankly. The states are, are the legislatures, not all of them, but the, you know, the large majority of them are just far more effective legislative institutions than the federal Congress. And, and I, I think most of them know that. I don't think they look at their cues. I think some of the toxic sort of partisan or the you know, toxic politics and, and media environment, social media, that stuff leaches down from, um, from the federal level. But I'd like to see I'd like to see them start to take a harder look at why your legislature's working. But I, I do understand what you're saying. Tim, I don't disagree with you about the effectiveness of the governance. But when we look at the, the relationship side of the House, the trends of the relationship side of the House are permeating through local government, right? So when we think about some of the national conversations that we've had in recent years, right, I'm feeling that at a local level. I live in a rural community in California. Right. I feel it all the time. Right. And that's not coming from the, the locals. I mean, when we if you went back maybe 20, 30 years, this community is a very loving community. They're always supporting each other. It's not necessarily a lot of resources from the public side of the house. Right. The county isn't flush with cash. So there's a lot of giving back to the community. There's a co-drive in the winter for kids. There's fundraisers all the time for uh, people with disabilities and education. and I mean, you name it. We have a lot of fundraisers happening. It's a very given community. And at the same time, the community has become very polarized in recent years because of what's happening on a national stage, right? So when we're talking about, you know, the effectiveness of legislatures, I'm an institution guy. There's no doubt that, uh, that state legislatures work and they work in very effective ways um, and they're more nimble, right? They're able to test things out. They're able to experiment with it. I think where the trend is coming into play, at least, I mean, you're the expert on, so you'll have to set me straight. We're starting to see that the trickle effect of even states are being influenced on a national scale now. Um, so when we're looking at, you know, the type of work that they're doing, it seems like there's a shift happening right now where there's more influence that might be more national type of policy interests that are coming into the state level for debate. And some are taking hold whether or not they represent the communities or not. I think there's some dynamics happening right now that I, I find really interesting and also excited to see um, how the state institutions respond to it. Yeah, that, that's the thing. I, <clears throat> I, I don't doubt for a second what you're saying, and I, I understand it completely about this notion of, you know, the, the, the hard lines, the hard sides uh, that, that exist. And by the way, it's not new. I, 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 I stumbled on an article about legislatures. It's about 16, 17 years old that we wrote in our magazine. We were bemoaning the increase in polarization and hyperpartisanship. You know, it's something that we've been coping with for a while. Um, and I was thinking about your town or your county and how, you know, there aren't 
there's not a Democratic coat drive and a Republican coat drive. You know, there's not a there's not a fundraiser for one side or the other. And yet we're becoming less able to sort of see each other as just humans that work together. Like you, I'm a big institution guy. I always come back to the fact that institution sounds like a big word. You know, it's the I, I, when people think of the legislative institution, they, they tend to think of these visuals of the capitals, you know, the big granite buildings. But it's really just humans at the end of the day. It's really just people with all of their glory and flaws uh, uh, coming together in one, making mistakes, but also striving to do the best they can. We want to make sure that we talk about LSMI. So let's let's shift to that. We're, we only got a few minutes left. First, explain to the audience here, uh, the podcast listeners, what is LSMI and how long you've been ing- involved with it and uh, what, do you, what do you love about it? Oh man, what don't I love about it? Uh, so um, LSMI has been around for 31 years. So we're into our uh, 31st year. Um, it started uh, from NCSL of uh, visionary Carl Kurtz and others um, who had this idea of what happens if we have a, an intensive training for senior legislative staff members. Um, that charge has continued through. The first 15 years were at the University of Minnesota at the Humphrey School uh, for the last 16 years, it's been a partnership between uh, the University of Southern California and the California State University, Sacramento, um, through their Center for California Studies, which has a robust fellows program uh, for the legislature, for the Assembly and Senate. They also have it for the executive and judicial. And the idea behind LSMI is, is getting into the space of how do we support staff from where they are and shifting the conversation away from the mechanics of their office, right? So things that might be more in the management space into leadership space. So how do we understand the role of vision, the role of influence? How will all those things start coming to play? How does communication look different within this space and other spaces? What do we know about risk? Um, what does risk look like? How do we get into this idea around confidence? Um, LSMI uh, started out in Sacramento as an eight-day residency uh, we now think about it as a four-month program. Uh, so that still has that eight-day residency at, at its heart. Um, and it has some pre-work about a month before in the virtual space and then optional executive coaching after the, the program ends. Um, getting into that space on how we help support all the fun work that's happening across the states. Uh, what excites me the most are all the staff that come and join um, LSMI at least 48 of the states have joined us so far in the Sacramento experience and three territories. Um, I shouldn't call them territories because I get yelled at for it. Um, but when we think about the work that LSMI does, you know, it represents all of the U.S., including all those pieces that make us great as, as a nation. And we've had some international participants in the past as well. And we're talking about senior level positions, both partisan and nonpartisan, you know, chiefs of staff, you know, directors of different offices all coming together uh, to be able to have great conversation and debate and lots of time to be able to connect with colleagues. And what's also exciting is recognizing where these folks go um, after LSMI. So they are part of LSMI. Um, a lot of them advance within their offices. Um, some offices see this as a major training component to how they promote staff within their organization. So it's become institutionalized in that way. I um, mean, it's also exciting to see the work that they do with NCSL of taking different leadership roles of, uh, you know, the staff chair in recent years has been an LSMI grad. And that's really exciting to know that this work continues to carry on. It's not something that we produce a lot of material and now you keep it on a shelf somewhere, um, but it's something that we uh, want to actively use and think about and debate. I mean, things like you're doing right now, Tim, of having conversations around it because there's not one right answer. And we have a lot of experiences at the same time, right? So how do we learn from each other within this space? This program to invest in these people, I, I think back to that notion that we're all just stewards of these institutions, that we've got our time, um, that will we'll be ephemeral, we will move on, uh, hopefully to better things, but you know, time takes its, uh, takes its path and we're on it. If you haven't done LSMI and you're uh, in, in a legislative management role, and, and particularly in those two states that haven't done it, we need to get together offline. we got to make sure and get some folks from those two states, but all the states, obviously, um, you really should take advantage of it because people, it, it is a, it's a career transformational event. Um, and it's an investment in, in the people who are the taking care of these institutions right now. So we're at, at, on the NCSL side, this is a terrific partnership. And I want to say not just with USC, but also obviously with 
Cal State Sacramento, and and you guys do a terrific uh, job of it. And, and uh, boy, it just it just gets better and better. So congratulations. Um, it is a it is a it is a legacy kind of program, I think, um, for you know both people on your in your roles as well as on the NCSL side. So. Um, what, what should we close with here, Paul? Uh, um, what Anything on your mind that we left out that uh, you'd like to share with the people of legislature world? The biggest thing is maybe what I should start off with of how much admiration I have for those that are in public service. Of recognizing it's not easy. I mean, it never was easy, and it's certainly not easy in today's environments, um, especially on how accessible all of us are, right? Maybe I can't call up Tim, but I know where Tim lives, right? Those things are... Uh, real factors that are happening have probably always existed, but now exist in this social media type of platform um, where the pressure points look different than they have in, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 years. I don't know how, how far back it goes, but we feel it in a different way. And part of that is because we're in the experience right now. So I just want to thank everyone that's in public service because our society wouldn't be what it is without your many contributions at all levels within organizations. So thanks for your work. Amen. What Paul said, terrific place to end it. Paul, really, really grateful for your time. Uh, thanks again, and and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks, Tim. Appreciate the time. I've been talking with Paul Danchik, Director of Executive Education in Sacramento for the University of Southern California, Saul Price School of Public Policy, and the co-director of the Legislative Staff Management Institute. Thank you for joining me and Paul on this episode of Legislatures, the Inside Story, brought to you by the National Conference of State Legislatures. You can check out all the podcasts from the National Conference of State Legislatures by searching for NCSL Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. Tim Story, NCSL's CEO, hosts Legislatures, the Inside Story, where he focuses on leadership and legislatures. The Our American States podcast dives into some of the most challenging public policy issues facing legislators. On Across the Aisle, host Kelly Griffin tells stories of bipartisanship. Also check out our special series, Building Democracy, on the history of legislatures. <laughs>